Prime Minister Mia Motley has long been public about the dire dangers that Barbados faces, as she says, due to its small size and vulnerability to economic and environmental shocks. And she's joining me now from Bridgetown, Barbados. Prime Minister, welcome to the program. Our situation is perhaps a little more unique because we suffer a number of um, risks. One, we are a highly indebted region largely because we are perhaps the most travel dependent and trade dependent region in the world with almost half of our GDP coming directly and indirectly and our jobs from tourism. Secondly, we are also on the cusp of the climate crisis. In fact, we are four weeks away from the beginning of the hurricane season. But what is little spoken about is that the climate crisis has also resulted in droughts and sargassum weed, which has meant a number of our hotel establishments and restaurants were already suffering before this pandemic. Mm. And now we add to this, this global pandemic. So that this is a yep. peculiar moment for Caribbean states, um, not just Barbados. And it is one in which we hope we can summon the, the, the um, rest of the global community to recognize that it is now more than ever that we need to recognize that global leadership is needed and that we need to accept that these islands, okay. as well as those in the South Pacific, are vulnerable. We also had problems when the WTO was formed. We recognized, for example, that much of our domestic production would shut down and it would make us more open. When we had 9-11, we had other issues that were imposed on us on a one-size-fits-all prescription. Now we have this pandemic. We need global leadership similar to what we had post-World War II to become, to be able to recognize that we need a plan that protects not just the strongest among us, but also the most vulnerable. You've called for um, there should be a vulnerability index, um, assessing potentially how exposed a country is to future economic and public health risks like climate change. I wonder how that would work. And on the vulnerability index, the Commonwealth Secretariat has in fact settled on a framework since 30 years ago, 1989. 31 years ago. Um, we believe it needs to be revisited, but we believe that you can't determine whether we need access to funding. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, Thank for that. You. Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados. Thank good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. My name is Dr. Jani Remy, and I serve the Sridhar Rampal Center at the University of the West Indies Cape Hill campus in Barbados as its deputy director. Welcome to you all to this session entitled Vulnerability to Resilience Using a Trade Vulnerability Index. Before I plunge into the discussion with my august panel, Bear with me as I offer just a little bit of context to the work that we at the SRC are doing on a trade vulnerability index or the TVI. The idea for the TVI emerged last year when my colleague Alicia Nichols at the SRC and I saw an interesting proposal submitted to the WTO's General Counsel by the United States in the context of reform discussion. In its communication of February, the United States sought to introduce new objective criteria into the WTO discussions on eligibility for developing country status that would use, among other criteria, GNI, gross national income, per capita. Now, for those of you who follow international development policy, you know that this is an indication that has been used in the past by many international organizations as a benchmark for determining a country's worthiness for all sorts of things like concessionary financing, debt cancellation, et cetera. And you would also be aware that it is not without controversy. In fact, including that criteria into the WTO developing country eligibility status would exclude a number of countries, including Caribbean countries, from eligibility as developing ones. In response to that proposal by the United States, we at the SRC began thinking about whether there was another more useful trade appropriate criteria that might more accurately measure and respond to the special needs of WTO member countries. 
As we were thinking about this, we came upon very interesting work coming out of the Caribbean Development Bank on the creation of a multidimensional vulnerability index. In a nutshell, that index was being proposed and building on earlier work by agencies such as the Commonwealth Secretariat as a tool to determine a country's vulnerability along three pillars, economic, environmental, and social. That index looks at proxies that are very much linked to economic and trade-related characteristics of countries, as well as newer issues like climate change vulnerability that show how naturally predisposed certain countries are to being vulnerable. We called the CDB and asked one of the lead economists working in this area, one of my co-panelists, Jason Cotton, to join forces with us and apply their index specifically to trade. And the rest is history. The immediate fruits of our efforts are available at our Tridas Rampal website, www.tridasrampalcenter.com, under the SRC Research Lab. Tab, excuse me. Since that original piece, I'm happy to say that our thinking on the matter has been further fine-tuned thanks to ongoing discussions with persons like those on this panel. I'm proud to welcome them, among the, them being the top economic and I would say legal minds as well on vulnerability indices, both from trade and the economic perspective that will help us begin thinking through the utility of a vulnerability index at the WTO and in other trade policy and trade negotiating context. So let me introduce my panel. First of all, let me introduce Mr. Travis Mitchell, advisor and head of economic policy and small states at the Commonwealth Secretariat, where he manages programs aimed at building economic and environmental resilience in small developing countries. I also want to welcome Mr. Jason Cotton of the be a country economist and one on the technical team responsible at the CDB for the creation of this multidimensional vulnerability index from which the Sridhar Rampal Center has devised its trade vulnerability index. And he's working with us on the development of that index. He's presently assigned the responsibility for monitoring the economies of Barbados and Jamaica and is the technical focal point at the CDB for research on vulnerability. Those of you who are more familiar with the trade landscape, Mr. Hannes Schloman will be no stranger to you. He's a seasoned trade lawyer and trade policy advisor, director of the WTI Advisors, an ex-partner at a law firm. For the past 20 years, he has advised, represented, and trained government and non-government stakeholders on many aspects of WTO law, regional, and bilateral trade agreements. And he works more concretely on areas such as services, agriculture, NAMA, and fishery subsidy, advising governments on trade policy and formulation and reform issues. And finally, but by no means least, Dr. Patrick Lowe, who is a fellow of the Asia Global Institute and works as a Geneva-based consultant on trade and trade-related manners. Among his many hats, he is perhaps best known in these WTO circles for having served from 1997 to 2013 as chief economist at the WTO Secretariat. So after these introductory remarks and the introductory video beckoning global leadership in this area of vulnerability from the Prime Minister of Barbados, Honorable Mia Motley, I'd like to now turn to you, the audience, and just ask you, please, that if you have any questions, that you write them into the chat function. And we will try to integrate them into our remarks as we go on. But we will also have a dedicated time at the end to answer any of the questions as they arise. So let's get first to um, Dr. Travis Mitchell, who I know due to an emergency situation will have to leave us early. But can I ask you, Mr. Mitchell, Given the historical interest and role of the Commonwealth Secretariat in this area of constructing vulnerability in the indices, you are well placed to guide us and briefly explain the value of a vulnerability index 
and really how the Commonwealth Secretariat has developed this index in the past and revised it today in the new and current international landscape. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Remy, colleagues, fellow panelists, participants. Uh, pleasure to be here and thank you so much for inviting the Commonwealth Secretariat to be part of this very uh, relevant and important discussion. And allow me also to apologize for having to leave uh, early due to unforeseen uh, circumstances. This is a conversation that I would have liked to uh, be here until the, the very end. Uh, but to get to the point uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Remy raised, or the questions rather, um, I'm proud to say that we at the Secretariat uh, have been advocating for the use of a vulnerability index uh, for more than 30, 40 years. We began this work uh, in the 80s when it became very evident that per capita GDP as a standalone criteria was not sufficient for allocating development finance uh, to small countries. And we have many examples. I mean, the pandemic has shown us uh, how vulnerable these small countries are uh, with regards to the dependence on trade, uh, and more pertinently with regards to their inability to respond to natural events, uh, such as those have, that we've seen in 2017, Hurricane uh, Dorian, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the vulnerability index really began as a need to capture in one figure, to communicate effectively uh, countries' vulnerability, to show where these countries lie on the vulnerability spectrum. As the Secretariat, we've actually commissioned a number of studies around vulnerability, but the most popular of those studies was done by Professor Biguglio from Malta. And in that study, Professor Biguglio characterized vulnerability merely in two strands, a country's uh, exposure to economic uh, events or shocks and to natural disasters. But there's one main difference between, I would say, the Commonwealth's approach to vulnerability and other approaches such as that by the UN Committee for Development Policy and even uh, as such by the Caribbean Development Bank, uh, which has uh, just revised their own index. We focus solely on structural vulnerability. That is, that which countries are unable to, to change. For example, a country cannot change its location. It cannot change its physical land mass. That is what we think is, is important to capture in vulnerability. Other indices, such as the Caribbean Development Bank Index, uh, has gone towards what you call a multidimensional approach to introduce social elements. And we do see that as important. But the issue that we see there is uh, some of these social vulnerabilities are actually endogenous or can be introduced through policy, through policy means. And that is a main departure, I think, between the Commonwealth's approach, the CDB and other, uh, and other approaches. Nonetheless, we do think there is need for a multidimensional approach. And what we are doing now in terms of the revision of our index, which we call a universal vulnerability index, is to also look at the issue of resilience. So we've moved beyond vulnerability to look at resilience. Why? Whilst vulnerability captures the susceptibility to shocks, resilience captures the ability of that country to respond. So what policies are they putting in place? What natural elements do they have which allows them to respond to these, to these events? And our universal vulnerability index will do a number of things. One, it will not only focus on uh, a small group or small states. For example, the Caribbean Development Bank Index focuses on Caribbean countries. The UN CDP index focuses on least developed countries. And our previous index focus on, focuses on small states. That, in a sense, has shot, uh, has to be, to be our, um, uh, have been to our detriment in the sense that um, the international institutions that we wish to influence have said that the use of these multiple indices has meant that there's no uh, common understanding of how countries rank on the vulnerability spectrum. So we are looking to have a universal index. We want to include resilience such as we focus on net vulnerability, and we want to make this index more dynamic. Most of these indices at this point are static in that they look at one particular uh, year. What we want to do is to track vulnerability over a period of time so that we can report on countries' vulnerability and assess it on, on an annual 
on an annual basis. Coming to your point and to the main element of this discussion, how can we use, for example, a trade vulnerability index in the context of the WTO? Now, I think this project is really magnificent. One, because we have discussed trade vulnerabilities. Uh, I can use the UNCDP as an example within the broad context of an economic vulnerability index. And that economic vulnerability index in the UNCDP's context has only been used to decide on whether a country should graduate or not from LDC benefits. However, uh, I think the TVI has a, a good start because we already look at, for example, trade concentration, um, the, um, the dependency on strategic imports and so on within the different uh, indices. If we can expand on these elements within a TVI, then we can more clearly look at how trade policy could be angled towards helping those most in need. I mean, the broad thrust of, of trade is free, free and fair trade. And vulnerabilities, uh, in a sense, restrict countries from being part of that broad thing, which we call globalization or global and global trade. So I think that uh, just like the just like how the UNCDP uses the vulnerability index, for example, to provide um, or to help remove supply constraints, for example, with regards energy, uh, with regards um, you know, dependency and the need for diversification, I think a trade vulnerability index could be the start of that discussion to see how trade policy could allow for these countries to more actively participate in trade. Thank you very much, Dr. Remy. Excellent, excellent remarks to start us off. I know you have to run off, but we at the WTO will be engaging the Commonwealth Secretary to help us think through these issues and think really concretely about how to use these proxies to assist in the trade and the trade policy related landscape. So thank you, Mr. Mitchell. I know you have to run off, so we will excuse you for an emergency situation. So to the rest of my panel, I think Mr. Mitchell has really um, hit the ground running. Um, and I wanted now to turn to uh, Mr. Cotton um, from the CDB um, to, to explain to the audience a little bit about how the CDB has worked off of the base created by the Commonwealth Secretary. Explain to the audience a little bit about what we mean by proxies and what the proxies under the suggested TVI would look like. And also, if you could, I mean, there's this issue that I think Mr. Mitchell already introduced, which is this idea that it's not confined only to small countries, because vulnerability can be sector specific, it can be negotiation specific. So can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with us on this TBI, not just to really zone in on the relevant proxies, but also expand its applicability beyond just small states? Thank you, Dr. Remy. A good day to my fellow panelists and all listeners. Like the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Caribbean Development Bank has a long tradition in developing economic vulnerability indices. It commenced uh, some two decades ago, back in the year 2000. And uh, as Mr. Mitchell said, the latest embodiment, and also Dr. Remy mentioned, the latest embodiment of this work is seen in our multidimensional vulnerability index, which was published in the year 2019 and available on our website. So this trade vulnerability index is really, as Dr. Remy mentioned in our opening remarks, an attempt to build on the work of CDB's MVI and proposes an objective methodology for determining WTO members' eligibility for special and differential treatment. And it is, it is important to contextualize this proposal within the wider body of knowledge on economic vulnerability, some of which uh, Travis mentioned. So, you know, there have been several attempts to measure economic vulnerability. Uh, we could see so far, or as we've heard, it has a long history. And Existing vulnerability indices, what they seek to do is to identify characteristics of, of economies, whether structural or institutional, uh, that can adversely affect uh, their, their, their performance. And 
in these uh, indices, some of the characteristics include export concentration. Uh, that's uh, the uh, how narrow uh, the, the export base of a, of a country is. Uh, dependence on strategic imports is another indicator highlighted in some of these indices. A small market size, geographic remoteness, uh, how susceptible uh, the country is to natural disasters, and of course, trade openness. So it is not surprising that trade features prominently in existing economic vulnerability indices. A trade is essential, and particularly for Caribbean countries, uh, for their development, for poverty reduction, and it represents on average about 53% of the region's GDP. So the obvious question therefore is, why do we need this trade vulnerability index? And I should say that, that this attempt is, is, or this trade vulnerability index is not an attempt to add to the clutter of existing vulnerability indices, but what it does is that it attempts to build on the work on economic vulnerability and really take a closer look at the characteristics. And these characteristics are both structural and institutional of countries that make them vulnerable in the global financial and trading system. So what we hope to achieve is an index that will be useful to trade negotiators where the proxy indicators can inform trade negotiations and can substantiate a country's claims about vulnerability on issue-specific or sector areas. Now, in order to achieve this goal, we utilize some of the trade-related indicators in the Economic Vulnerability Index, but we also propose some additional indicators. And these additional indicators would include, uh, for example, low market share of global trade. And the rationale for that is that countries that represent a relatively small share of global trade are sometimes considered uh, too trivial to merit consideration in international trade agreements. And as such, their specific interests are sometimes unrepresented in trade agreements, uh, which contributes to their vulnerability. Another proxy indicator that we think is possible in this trade vulnerability index is weak trade facilitation. And trade facilitation remains important for developing countries in an increasingly interconnected world. Weak trade facilitation can increase the cost and time to trade and can be an additional barrier to the inclusion, particularly of small and medium enterprises in, in global value systems. Uh, inadequate access to trade finance. Uh, access to finance, as, as we all know, is a significant barrier to trade uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, particularly in, in small open economies. And when we, when we combine that constraint in terms of access to finance uh, with other challenges, for example, the uh, inadequate availability of skilled human resources, uh, inadequate market development, it really narrows the opportunities to participate in, in external trade. Uh, market rigidities and, and, and barriers is, a, is another possible proxy indicator that we propose in this trade vulnerability index. And what we're thinking there is that weak, weak nas national institutions and market rigidities can really restrict an economy's ability to recover from a shock and participate in the international trading system. And the final uh, new indicator that we, we, we think could be relevant is weak governance. Where, uh, where there's a weak governance uh, in, a, in a country, where governments are unwilling or unable to carry out their responsibilities, this means that uh, public authorities do not protect rights or, or provide basic uh, public services. And this government uh, failure, uh, quote unquote, would lead to broader failures in political, economic, and, and civil institutions, and can even constrain uh, foreign direct investment, uh, which can be a barrier to trade. Now, as, as, as Dr. Remy said, uh, as we propose these indicators, we are not 
initially uh, indicating which countries would, uh, in an index like this, uh, be classified as either uh, highly vulnerable in this trade vulnerability index or, or not. Uh, the decision as to which countries or how countries rank would pretty much be determined based on the information that is submitted to the in the index and the, the relative vulnerability of the countries. And in addition to these proposed new indicators in this trade vulnerability index, uh, there's another reason that I think distinguishes this trade vulnerability index from the economic vulnerability index, as, as, as Travis uh, gave us a very good introduction to, and that's the objective. Now, the, the application of economic vulnerability indices, as conceptualized by the Commonwealth Secretariat and the CDB, uh, the, the applicability is really to uh, widening access to concessional finance, and in the context of, of, of COVID-19, as well, also possibly providing some, some uh, support in terms of arguments for, for debt relief. The, the application of the Trade Vulnerability Index, however, is, is, is not focused on overseas development assistance, as it were, but rather uh, really places a very, very uh, specific lens or focus on access to special and differential treatment at the WTO. And what we do is we seek to identify these trade vulnerabilities really uh, as a way to inform strategies to help build resilience. And I think that's that's a very, very important point. Uh, it's, it's really uh, identifying these to help countries to uh, gain the support that they need to help them to become more resilient and to foster beneficial integration into the multilateral trading system. And uh, as I'm about to close, I would just like to say that um, the development of this trade vulnerability index is still at a very early stage. Uh, we've proposed a uh, design for the index. We have two broad pillars comprised of structural and institutional factors. We have identified some possible proxy indicators for each of these two pillars. Uh, we have an initial weighting system and some thoughts on how these uh, indicators in the index may be of use to trade negotiators. Now, the criteria or the available literature is predominantly what uh, influenced the uh, selection of proxy indicators. But of course, as the index is, 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 is designed, as we, as, we, as we begin to actually construct it, uh, statistical and econometric techniques would guide uh, the final selection of indicators. So today, uh, we put forward to you this Trade Vulnerability Index Framework for your consideration as a possible criteria for access to special and differential treatment, either in collaboration with existing criteria or perhaps even as a standalone criteria, which is a bit more ambitious. And so I think we really welcome feedback and comments as we continue to refine the methodology and approach. And with those remarks, I say thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jason, for you know laying out in quite detail um, some of the thinking behind this vulnerability index as it is applied specifically to the trade context. And at this point, it's really useful to get some of the boots on the ground reaction. So people who have and understand the dynamics of the WTO, the sensitivities, um, and, and all of the history because this is not the first time that small vulnerable economies have brought this to the WTO membership for consideration. And there are some nuances and differences of bringing it, it, it you know, into the discussion now. But for that, I will turn now to Mr. Sloman to talk to us a little bit about the reality on the ground. So there may be some doubt about the utility of a trade vulnerability index, especially given the charged nature of the trade negotiations and policy at the WTO, is this the right time to think about the TVI as a basis, not just for SNDT, but even more targeted responses to trade? And what do you think the value of the TVI is in that conversation? 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Janive, and uh, thanks, Jason, and also Travis in absentia for uh, for these uh, for these introductions and and these observations. Uh, in short, I believe the value uh, of a TVI is very significant. Um, I do not necessarily expect the TVI to be some to be the basis of some sort of automaticism, although it could become that. But I believe the unique value of this exercise uh, lies in the fact that it it uh, helps identify better identify a problem a challenge um, with the idea of looking very carefully and targetedly at uh, targeted solutions at responses to issues we all agree are there um, so the point, I believe, is, uh, is about securing that the language of vulnerability and hence that of resilience for all is uh, present when trade policy uh, is made. Um, we need to improve the discourse. Now, uh, this is not entirely new. This has been discussed over the past uh, uh, decades. Um, but I think we are still looking at a system, and I, by the system, I do not just mean the WTO as a legal system, but overall our trade policy making mind frame, if you like, we're looking at a system that is still in a relatively raw state and that has relatively raw rules and thinking uh, patterns. And I think that's where we need to uh, attack. Um, I think it is, first of all, about accepting the principle of vulnerability. Um, and I think everyone who looks at those indicators will nod the head and say, yes, these are vulnerabilities. We need to somehow at least take note of them. Um, I would also argue that this is really not just about S and D, special and differential treatment. In fact, I'd like this discussion not to be in that box at all, if I may. Um, special and differential treatment is a reaction to the needs of the system, really the system, let me focus on that, to treat, to, uh, to establish equality and equitability in its workings. Um, so it's not just about helping, sorry, it's not just about helping uh, individual countries in need, it's about helping the system to function better. And I think that's very important for us to, to, to realize, and that goes right to the heart of the WTO. Um, so when we attempt to draw a clearer, perhaps not necessarily straight, but clearer line between a problem and possible solutions, we should move forward carefully with due respect for the, for the realities on the ground. And I'll come to those realities in just one second. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should not try to do what can be done. Now, um, Jason would have mentioned the multidimensional, or in fact, Travis already mentioned the multidimensional approach uh, that this uh, exercise in uh, looking for a trade vulnerability act, uh, index uh, takes. Um, and that's something I want, can, want to come back to in just one second, uh, Janiv, um, namely with respect to one criterion, which is trade openness. Because some of these vulnerabilities are matters of choice, um, choice in the, but choices that are desirable from the systemic perspective. Um, we should not, uh, uh, not, not lose sight of that. And, and those uh, matters play a role in addition to those that can be summarized as social or perhaps governance issues. Um, so what is it that this can do? Uh, that was the question you were putting to me. Um, I think we need to look at a very simple analytical framework. <laughs> we have issues, those that are in the index and perhaps others that are not yet in the index. Um, and we have possible responses that are trade related. So remember, we're looking for trade related responses or trade policy responses to trade related vulnerability factors. So what could those responses be? Well, oh, really five levels. Um, and I want to mention them all, all five really. Um, we could build this into our national policy making discourse. Um, now that seems obvious, most countries are doing that, but this index could help them um, pinpoint the issues as Jason would have just uh, said. Um, so that index on the purely national policy making front 
of the vulnerable country could already matter greatly. Second, of course, it matters in our discussions with, with third countries, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately saying our discussions, not negotiations, because often we're not in the, in the mode of negotiating a new agreement or something very specific um, that needs, the, needs, needs legal format, but we are talking about policy responses of third countries. Sometimes these third countries can adjust their policies that may affect us um, it, when we talk to them. Third, we can adjust the interpretation of existing rules. Existing rules, and that goes now to the WTO and WTO law, we can adjust the interpretation of existing rules where they leave space for interpretation. And vulnerability needs a name and needs a language to do that. I think the index could make a contribution to that. I could well uh, imagine that in the future, the WTO dispute settlement system, if it is still alive when we get there, uh, may find ways of referring to those criteria in a more concise, more focused way, and possibly even use an index like this as an indicator to interpret certain flexibilities uh, or, or indications in WTO language. Uh, you are re realizing that I'm getting to those points that are perhaps most on people's minds, but I was very it was very important for me to move slowly here. We can, of course, also negotiate new rules, and I can think of a, a bucket full of new rules that could address or ref reflect vulnerabilities, such as, uh, such as uh, adjusting the, the rules of which subsidies you can use, for example, or which defense mechanisms you can use in which situation. You can adjust quite a number of rules that go to either obligations or rights. I'll come perhaps to that uh, when we come back to this. And finally, so rulemaking, that would be item number five. Oh, and finally, we can uh, adjust what we negotiate. Trade negotiations, of course, are most famous for, not for their rulemaking, but for their bargaining. I, I give you this tariff, you give me that tariff. Like in that bargaining, uh, it's not just numbers, it's also understanding what the other needs and, and reacting to that, what I need and what the other needs. And so in these negotiations, a vulnerability as a factor can play a role. And of course, that has already happened in the WTO, for example. When in the Doha round, we had certain indicators of uh, share of world market uh, for small countries. So, so these, are, these are very concrete uh, um, areas. Uh, Jen, Eve, if you give me 10 more seconds, I will come to one or two examples. Um, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. We had had kind of thought about that later on, but you're on a roll. Go ahead. Go no ahead worries. with the time. So I will just drop a hint, and then we can perhaps back to that. Yes. So um, if I already mentioned that uh, certain factors that uh, Jason would have uh, would have mentioned um, would suggest that we could very legitimately um, uh, use uh, or consider flexibilized uh, flexibilized defense mechanisms for countries that are vulnerable or for countries that have certain vulnerabilities in cases where those vulnerabilities are at play. We can also think of this index not as just one index, but as a, as a collection of indices, if you want, if you, if you, if you want sub-indices, uh, that could be used in those contexts. So um, what do I mean by that? I mean things like uh, allowing small countries that may not have a trade defense, uh, uh, trade defense department even, because the administration is so small and it doesn't, it's not worth maintaining one, uh, for the occasional case, that those countries that have agreed to trade openness and are doing well with, doing, uh, with practicing it, but now have a shock, an external shock, get an easier access to reaction. Um, that is something that was discussed in the context of the special safeguard mechanism in agriculture. Uh, it didn't go that well, as we all know, um, because uh, they were there were, there were perhaps too many that wanted the mechanism to work for them, let me put it this way. Um, so the vulnerability aspect was not, uh, did not carry the day, but that doesn't mean that the idea, at least for a truly vulnerable small country, uh, isn't, doesn't hold water. It holds a lot of water. Um, Hannah, just on that, if I can, yes. because it's such a, a, a controversial area and may well illustrate how this vulnerability might be, uh, index might be useful. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to be sensitive to is that 
the WTO is a potpourri of many different types of developing countries. Uh, and that in itself makes it very difficult to construct any kind of objective criteria that is going to pass muster. But in the example that you raised, could you ever contemplate a situation where a country that is not necessarily geographically small could nonetheless point to a vulnerability in a particular moment in time, in a particular sector, that we could use that vulnerability index as a educational and eventually a policy sort of opening uh, to unleash and make the negotiations a little bit more informed so that instead of it only being used in the context of small countries having uh, to deploy it across all negotiations, it can also be weighted or targeted to specific negotiations in specific contexts. Well, I would certainly say, um, Jenny, that the that vulnerability is for everyone, <laughs> or it's against everyone, if you like. Uh, and it's something that we all noticed uh, when COVID came along, if we hadn't noticed it before. Um, so yes, the answer is yes to your question. We can definitely uh, imagine using the discourse of vulnerability in a more structured way based on this work um, for countries that may not even feel vulnerable all the time, but are vulnerable in certain situations or at certain times. Um, for me, the important thing is, and you and I, we're trade lawyers, we grew up in the system, if you like. Uh, our intuitive reaction is to say that doesn't fly, that doesn't work. I think it's very important that we don't let the beauty of uh, simplicity um, come into the way of, uh, of the need for targeted uh, solutions. I think we all need to grow up in our discourse. We have done that in our national legal systems a long time ago. Uh, remember any discussion about flat tax? Flat tax sounds great until you get to the point where somebody has a major impediment and then is taxed with a flat tax and everyone says, no way you should tax that person on that part of its income. And there we go. That is the type of uh, discourse we need to have. And we need to have, we need to recognize that the trade system is still a raw system of law and it will evolve, it needs to evolve. And this is an attempt to contribute to that. But Janine, I think what is really important is that we don't get stuck just on those defense mechanisms. Because I think one aspect that uh, Travis would have mentioned is this dependency on strategic imports. So I want to import PPE, agricultural goods, food, other essential things. I want to import them, and I am a country that depends on those imports, either by reasons of natural uh, conditions, such as remoteness uh, or smallness, or by reasons of me having agreed to a radical trade opening, because that's what was good, generally speaking. So I'm now dependent on those strategic imports, and others need to supply me with those imports, right? So in that situation, and we've all gone through that thinking in the past six months, in that situation, it is not frivolous at all to say vulnerable countries, specifically vulnerable countries, need to, or there is a good reason to think that they might get special rights or special recognition, maybe in the form of authorizing exporting countries that for good reasons for themselves want to impose an export restriction, could exempt vulnerable countries, vulnerable importing countries from that restriction. Could, I'm not saying they must, maybe they, I don't think we might get a rule that, where that obliges them to do that, but it titles them to do that in violation of MFN, for example. That's very concrete. We have Article 12 in the Agreement on Agriculture, which already requires something like that to be done to look at the needs of importing countries. Now, Article 11 of the GATT does not do that does not say the same thing. We could do that. So this is a way of using vulnerability as a framework. Whether we use the index or not is secondary, but the index can help frame that type of discourse. Um, as I said, it could come in the form of interpretation or new rules. That's the same thing. The important point is that we recognize the problem and the need for solutions. Thank you so much, Hannes, for that. I think um, beginning to think really concretely um, but beyond concrete examples, beginning to understand the principle of vulnerability as something, as you said, that is simple and that most people 
would react to obviously and say, of course, a country that is more vulnerable to hurricanes and the hurricane cycle every single year. And, and it's not only when it hits, it's the preparation for when it hits um, should evoke a certain reaction among the international community. I think where the distance has to be reached, uh, sorry, broached a little bit is in, well, what does that mean for tangible trade solutions? And I think you've begun to uh, sort of unwrap that hard nugget of an issue. You know, what do we really tangibly mean? What are we asking for that's not already available in the rules? Um, because that's what that's one of the things you hear often. But this stuff has already been discussed. It's already there's a facility in the rules for some of these uh, problems to be addressed. And I think some of the things you're raising is that no, there can be more steps taken. And I think some of the, the explanatory force of a vulnerability index is to, you know, quantify, measure, so that that is not even in 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 doubt. Uh, because sometimes you might hear, yes, you say you're vulnerable, and some of the discussions before have been, the word has been bandied about, but the advantage of a vulnerability index that is part of a wider body of work is we're beginning to use statistical methods to quantify levels of vulnerability. And I wonder, bearing in mind his background, not just in um, economics, but also understanding the framework of the WTO a little bit, if I can now pull in uh, Patrick, to talk a little bit about this issue um, from his lens, which is given, I think, the limited and divisive discussion that we've had so far about really making SNDT effective, um, making it much more effective, what role do you think a trade vulnerability index can possibly play in facilitating or generating more positive trade outcomes for the most vulnerable developing countries. Patrick? Thank you, Janiv. I can't start with special and differential treatment, otherwise I'll just be mouthing things that aren't very interesting. I have to start with the index and with vulnerability. Indexes can be useful and they can be worse than useless. Depends a lot on how they are constructed and what their intent is. I'm confident that the trade vulnerability index that Travis and Jason are working on would, can potentially be very useful. Very useful in lending some precision to, uh, to assessments of uh, real vulnerability, which we need to talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, and also to weight relative risks. But constructing one of these things is a challenge. You've got to work out what variables you want to um, zone in on. You've got to make sure that they don't um, correlate with one another so that you distort the picture. You've got to um, work out the weighting of them. There's no such thing as a, a zero weighting because even if you weight them all equally, that's a weighting. So I think these are all real challenges that, that Travis and Jason are going to have to struggle with when they get further down the road of actually using, um, using uh, real data. And all the things that you've discussed so far, I do think that, that these, these indexes are perfectly capable of doing it. And one of the really nice things you can do with them is undertake sensitivity analysis. You can say, what happens if I put these weights? What happens if I put these variables? and do a lot of sensitivity analysis. So oftentimes people who do econometrics type work, forget about the sensitivity analysis and think they've discovered the truth. So that's what I'd like to say about indexes, that they, they're great, but they are to be used with lots of health warnings. Then a, a little word on vulnerability. I, 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 I accept that every country is vulnerable in some way or another, at some point or another, and it's all relative, isn't it? But what kind of vulnerabilities are we talking about? So I was just thinking of a very crude taxonomy of the sorts of vulnerabilities that we're talking about, which may give a, a, a kind of pathway into thinking about what you do about them, what kind of policies are relevant to them. So there are the vulnerabilities which are sudden exogenous events. You can only partially expect them from, from historical experience. And most of those, and certainly in the Caribbean, are weather-related. 
So that's one kind of vulnerability, and the Caribbean is particularly vulnerable to that vulnerability. Other vulnerabilities are unchangeable in a sense. They are givens, but um, they're known. Things like distance, remoteness, population size, market size, product concentration in pre-production and exports, strategic imports, as have been mentioned. Some of these may evolve and change over time, and some of them might not. So there's a kind of, there are two cat categories here, some that maybe over the longer term can be changed, and others which absolutely cannot be changed. So what do you do about those? And I think that we can think about that as well. And then there's the changeable ones, the ones that you really can change. Um, this is to do with things like these are enhancing capabilities, technical capacity, infrastructure, managing MISMEs, helping manage MISMEs, different kinds of policy reform, uh, efforts of diversification, the use of technical assistance, capacity building, trade finance to enable all these things to happen. So when we put it in that framework, some of those things have to be you have to live with them and, and manage them, and some of them you can change. And I think when you look at it that way, it helps us to think more constructively about the special and differential treatment question. Special differential treatment or trying to um, calibrate the appropriate balance of rights and obligations in, in the system is something that has bedeviled the system for a very long time. And personally, the starting point for me of this of this study, I don't think, I don't, you know, a good response to the US idea that it's a binary world, but, but going from there to trying to change the arguments behind the binary determination seems to me not to be the way to go. So I think it's got to be a lot more about what you need very specifically, and this is comes to really cutting and slicing and dicing the index in the way that Hannes was talking about right at the end of what he was saying. Um, but if we think of what, what are the kinds of things you can expect in what we call special and differential treatment? You can get phase-in periods for regulatory obligations. You can get thresholds to take account of country size or market share. You can, do, you can manage somehow, and this is not very well defined, expectations with respect to levels of market opening. Um, I do take Hannes's point that you can re render your vulnerability greater by opening your market to a greater degree. And there you have the trade-off between not opening and getting the benefits from opening or opening and then having to deal with the fallout when it comes along and you haven't really expected it and haven't necessarily catered for it. So the trick is to try to cater for it. And there are the emergency responses to emergency situations which should be, which really involve what a country can do. Now it's, it, may, it may be an issue of whether it's permitted to do it, but it's really what the country does. Different kinds of safeguard measures different kinds of temporary abrogations from, um, from their own, from own obligations. Are these adequate in the system? I think this is a, this is a, an analytical question based on practice. It's, it's not, it, I don't think there's the principle, the principle of safeguards has always been in, a, in, in, in the, in the gap WTO. It's not that it's how it's designed and how it's triggered and what a country can do for itself in this, in the, in these circumstances. And then there are those elements that are to do with trading partners. Well, only partly to trading. One can do a certain amount oneself about these things, but things like, and this is again, things that Hannes, Hannes has talked about at uh, some length, keeping trade open. Um, other time, types of trade sensitivities. I think if we've learned anything from COVID, well, we've learned lots of things from COVID actually. But one of the things we've learned is that there is a lot more flexibility in the system in terms of regulation, in terms of standards, in terms of procedures, in terms of process, which could be and has been done without getting into that sort of scare scenario of, oh, I can't know my standards and so that you kill my population. It's not that kind of thing. It's the way they operate, whether or not they're appropriate for what they're intended to do uh, and how they are operated. So, COVID has given us some, uh, I think there's a really interesting study to be made of what relaxations dozens of countries adopted in order to facilitate trade in the, in the, in the shadow of COVID. 
Now, were any of these intrinsically risky and just put there because of COVID? I wonder and I doubt. So that surely is something we can take and, and really look at carefully and say, well, look, we could be making things much easier anyway. And then we may be worried less about vulnerabilities. So I think if you put it in that context, it's not just about what treatment you can expect in the, in the WTO system of rules. It's about what else can be done. Technical capacity, uh, technical assistance capacity building is really important here. Uh, tech, uh, different kinds of assistance to in the financial side, debt related issues, trade finance related issues. This is a this is a bigger package than just special and differential treatment. And I and I think that's becoming increasingly clear in the way the work has evolved. When I look at the early iterations of the of the work, they were mostly about special and differential treatment. It is an important part, but it's only one part. And I think it's a very rich um, avenue for analysis on the back of a system which evaluates through the index where the vulnerabilities lie, what the expectations could be with respect to their occurrence, and what might be done about them. So I'm all for the index, but I'm all for contextualizing it more broadly as well. Thank you. Excellent, Patrick. I, I don't want to take you off the hook quite as yet. Um, one of the things that you mentioned um, about the difficulty of an index relates to uh, how how do you keep it relevant? How do you how do you stack it with data in a sense? Um, because it. you shouldn't say stack it. That sounds really suspicious. Populated it sounds like an election. <laughs> a very touchy topic now. But how do you keep it popul uh, populated and continually uh, relevant and, and, and updated with data from all sorts of different sources to keep all of the sub indices and the proxies actually uh, relevant to the discussions we're having? And I was having a discussion about uh, with Jason earlier um, about you know climate change, for instance, because that's that's one thing that's really really relevant at least in my region and to other uh, parts of the of the world. And it's going to become a global issue. So it's not only going to locate itself in terms of relevance in the Caribbean, but it's going to be something that more and more countries will, will face vulnerabilities around, um, going to your point of universality. But to go back to my question of how or indebtedness, any of these issues that are likely to play up, how do we keep from your standpoint, and having um, you know been the chief economist of the uh, of the WTO, how would you suggest um, we could keep the TVI once it is developed um, updated with with, with relevant uh, statistics uh, to, to to validate uh, the proxy? Is is this something that we could rely on international organizations working together, um, agreeing to contribute? The, the, the data they have on climate change for the climate change organization or on indebtedness or on trade, depending on, on, on where their area of specialization is. I guess I'm working towards how, you know, we operationalize this. CBI. Yeah, I, I think, I don't, I don't think it's so much a question of getting them to supply the data. The data are there. This is something for the managers of the, um, of the index. And there's a distinction to be made here between making the index relevant to the current realities, and that does mean changing the variables, no doubt, and, and not trying to tell a different story with the index. I mean, change course with it. I mean, you've got, you've, got your, you've, got your, you've got your context, you've got your vulnerabilities. Some will become, some issues will become a greater source of vulnerability than others. And there's no reason on earth why neither the data nor the weighting should not reflect that. But it's got to be absolutely explicit what you're doing and why you're doing it. You know, there's, um, there's, there's been some issues with what, what a, a certain um, index of the World Bank recently, precisely because it kept hopping around and changing the variables. And eventually the variables were allegedly um, manipulated in order to change rankings on the on the uh, index. This is the kind of thing that is avoidable. And I think it's really important to have people working with this index who truly understand and know indexes, and that excludes me. But you've got Travis, Travis and, and Jason there, and I'm sure lots of others. Excellent. So thank you so much for that. 
uh, audience, if you have any questions, I know it's very early in the morning here in the Caribbean, um, and I know there's interest in this panel, so please feel free to weigh in, but we, we can continue. And I want to go back to Jason. Um, I think COVID has exposed, and I think some of the, 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 um, the preceding panelists has exposed a certain degree of shared vulnerability for all countries, all countries of the WTO. I guess the question is in manipulating, but not in a, a, an evil way, Patrick, but in, in understanding how to actually apply the index. Um, how can the TBI assist with determining which vulnerabilities in which context can be addressed at the WTO? And, and taking into account um, all that Patrick says about ensuring its universality uh, and making it appropriate to specific issues that are coming up in the trade agenda, trade financing, et cetera, et cetera. How do you envisage utilizing the TBI to address these issues, not necessarily framed as SNDP issues, but just issues that typically developing countries um, have actually, uh, are actually facing? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. But before I answer that question, I just want to circle back to the to the data uh, question that you asked, uh, uh, Patrick. I was I was chomping at the bit, hoping that um, you would call upon me. But seeing that you you called me now, I I would give my my, my intervention there. So just from a very practical perspective, uh, in terms of the data, uh, when you're developing these these indices, uh, it really needs to be chosen very, very carefully, uh, particularly uh, in the context of, 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 of small states, uh, because the, they have more pressing data constraints. And, and I would say that um, from a very practical perspective in developing these indices, uh, when one is considering any phenomenon that you're going to include in the index, whether it's climate change, whether it is export concentration, smallness, et cetera, there are some very practical considerations that, that, that one needs to bear in mind um, when trying to, when trying to, to, to determine uh, the nature of the proxy indicator, which is, as, as Patrick says, where, where things get a little complicated. The data firstly needs to be easily accessible. It needs to be available. Um, and it needs to be not only available, but it needs to be available from a credible source. Uh, you want to ensure that uh, the source of the data that you're using uh, is a credible one uh, and wouldn't undermine the, 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 the utility of the index. You also want to ensure that uh, the, the, the data or the way it is represented is easy to understand. Uh, you, you don't want, you don't want uh, uh, to use data points, et cetera, that, that are overly uh, uh, complex or people, it won't be easy to, to, to communicate what it is trying to, what is trying to uh, highlight. And you have to think about the frequency uh, because as Travis was saying, uh, one of the things for the utility and, 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 and Hannes mentioned some, some excellent points uh, really from a, a negotiator's perspective. But the utility of this is that you could update it with a certain periodicity. Uh, annually, perhaps, that may be, may be the most realistic periodicity. And so you have to ensure that whatever data that, or data set that you are using uh, will be available at that periodicity. Other than that, the, the, the index becomes, in terms of its practical utility, to inform uh, as Hannes was speaking about decision making, whether at the country level, et cetera, it becomes uh, less and less potent as it will. Uh, so, so, so that's on the data side. On the on the other question, I would say, uh, are, 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 you know, are vulnerabilities equal? Um, I would argue that um, this index could could answer that question um, because what. When we think about what we're trying to do, at, at, in, in the very essence of what we're trying to do is, is we are putting these objective criteria uh, there in this index. Um, and the result of uh, the index would really be uh, a score, as it were, 
or, or a rank of, of all of these areas of, of vulnerability. And, and of course, in this ranking, there will be some threshold as to what is low, what is medium, what is high. And as such, the, the index itself uh, could help you to determine um, uh, which vulnerabilities are more important, uh, which ones uh, deserve more priority uh, based, on, based on the data. Uh, and so, and so the point here comes back to this idea of of, a, of an ob objective assessment uh, of the various indicators and, and and how we can make decisions based on it. Uh, Patrick also said that um, something very important in terms of weighting. You know, a priori we could say that um, if we have to prioritize or if we if we have to look at these um, trade vulnerabilities, that they all equally weighted. Um, that is one. That is one approach to say that they they equal in terms of their importance. But then there are other approaches. For example, uh, we can we can allow um, international priorities to also provide guidance as to as to how we how we weight the index and what priority is given to one indicator as opposed to the other. So the the, the point is 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 is, is that. Uh, there is some measure of flexibility. Now, now I'm using this cautiously um, because the index is not one to be manipulated for, 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 for any argument that one wants to make. But I'm saying in terms of constructing the broad parameters of it, um, in terms of how you decide on a weighting scheme, et cetera, uh, there may be some flexibility in determining those broad parameters and not necessarily in in the results that come out of it. Thank you so much, Jason. I want to take some of the questions that are coming in, which we kind of anticipated would be where we would eventually get to, um, which is really the political support for this. Um, because I think, you know, we've laid out the case for the, the, the technical, the economic argument. Um, I think some of the questions that may still be lingering, and I, I, I will ask the question and ask any of the panelists to jump in. Um, maybe more of a political nature. Somebody asked, um, have the small and vulnerable economies um, been able to build political support for the idea of a TDI? Is there any political developing or developed country group that has openly voiced support for the index? And to build on that similar uh, train of questioning, how do you actually seek to build support among countries that may disadvantage, uh, be disadvantaged um, thinking about SNDP by use of a TBI. He, the person said, I imagine that certain emerging economies such as China and India would not necessarily count as vulnerable. Um, I wonder if I can ask any of the panelists to take a stab at that question. Yes, Hannes, go Jenny, ahead. I'm happy to do that. I, I think this is where I think it is very important that we conduct this work. And by that, I mean all of us in the system conduct the work on thinking about how vulnerability might connect to solutions, we, that we do this bottom up. If we do this top down and say, hey, how do I qualify as a country that is privileged? I've already lost. And that's not where we should be going with this work. And I'm not, this is why I think the link between this and special and differential treatment is a different question that we should answer and ask at the right time in the right context. But the analytical and including the, the creative work in the sort of what could this do for us? And I expose some of some ideas where this could actually find manifestation in the system. Um, is uh, sh should not be infused too early and too much by the fear that some people might not like it because they fear that downstream it might affect them. I actually don't think it will nor should it affect in any way China, India or others in an inappropriate way. Um, now, vulnerability does have something to s do with the size of your belly, um, but it, that's by no means the only factor here. And uh, as, as Jason would have said, um, you know, even bigger countries could possibly use the notion of vulnerability, and I think they have been using that right now in the COVID crisis, 
The idea is there and nobody disagrees, right? They have been using this, but there was no clear way of framing it. It's an ad hoc thing. And I think the index could help frame that argument in the future. So yes, I think whenever you talk about something that could lead to some kind of new differentiation between WTO members, the alarm bells go up and that's our daily bread. And that's a bit, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate because I understand why those alarm bells go up, but at the same time, it's, it, it, it is sad if that stops us from thinking creatively. And I, I would implore us not to think of a straight line between the index and some kind of rights at the WTO. It might at some point be coming. My hypothesis is that some of those things, and I would have exposed some of them, are probably close to consensus. The idea that for an export restriction, you would perhaps have to look or you would be encouraged, you know, there should be a should provision, to encourage to look at the vulnerability of importing countries. Is that controversial? I don't think so. I don't think that's controversial. So we can, we can Im imagine a number of flexible uses of this and uh, not necessarily thinking immediately of the new Doha when that, whenever that is renamed into a new round parameters for NAMA and this is the automatic system. We may or may not have this then as some factor or some of the elements of the index to, uh, to, to for perhaps form a sub-index or WTO members would after negotiation agree that a combination of three factors may be used for one particular flexibility in the modalities. That is absolutely thinkable. It's not revolutionary at all. What the index would do is to help them do that but not, not with the aim of building something that then Patrick would have said, you know, manipulate it so that it fits your purpose. That would be a disaster. But it also is something that one can uh, stop from happening by simply going open source, you know, and open use. Because I, I can see this index, this index to be used flexibly. You know, there might be a situation where the people who set up the index come up with an overall score for whatever reason, you know, even just in order to get into the news, right? because some, some of these things also need some publicity. But at the same time, everybody could use the sub-indices as they see fit, right? You could even imagine a, a web tool to do that very quickly. Uh, you, you, you choose your five red five and say, this is what matters in my relationship with my neighboring country, for example. And, and, you, and you build your own little sub-index for your FTA negotiations. I think that's quite possible. So I think we should not be too fearful, neither should India, China, or others, um, because there is a there there is a there there is there is a great benefit in a win win reflection. Patrick would have referred to that, um, and 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 now we have a situation where we are almost in a sandbox because COVID uh, has uh, has stimulated a lot of thought. And I think this this is not entirely new thinking, but it's new thinking in in a promising on a promising path that could, I think, uh, provide some answers to some of the questions, including PPE equipment supply. You know, that was a very concrete existential question. Uh, uh, respirators, agricultural goods, et cetera, et cetera. JY, I'll leave it there. I have a few more points if you like. Thank you so much, Hannes. I, I think uh, there's a broader discussion that's happening. Sorry, Jason, just to, to add to, to answer the question, there's a broader discussion that Remember, this TBI is actually emanating from other universal work that is, at least in, on, the, on the side of the Caribbean countries, that being is being used to equip the argument that uh, for concessionary funding as, debt, as well as debt cancellation, that a, a, a vulnerability index would be really useful in these kind of more UN, IMF, World Bank um, relevant discussions. Um, and so, you know, the use to which you put a vulnerability index may differ across the different fora. And I love the point, Hannes, that you're making is there is a universal index, and that's the point of departure. It could be contextualized depending on the negotiation and the negotiating culture with which you're seeking to deploy it. And in that context, I think at that broader level, because of a lot of the advocacy by certain countries affected by COVID, the most vulnerable in that context, there may be some galvanization of efforts and acceptance, and I, I wouldn't want to name countries right now, but there may be an emerging sort of view that, yes, certain countries are vulnerable, and it has been taken up by certain uh, entities, including the UNFCCC, 
um, um, the, the head of the UN ECLAC has said that the Caribbean countries are on the front line of some of these um, negative consequences of COVID. And I imagine that the case can be made for other regions and for other countries as well. Again, without being, with being a little bit agnostic about who would qualify as vulnerable is the great sell of this CBI because it's not stacked. It's meant to be um, really, as Hannes, you're saying, bottom up as well as you, Patrick. And that's ultimately going to be the selling value of, of, of any TBI that is constructed. I, I wonder in the last 10, 15 minutes whether we can move, and Jason, you can wrap your, because I know you wanted to intervene, wrap your thinking a little bit around the resilience angle. So thinking really concretely about the different proxies, I think Patrick mentioned that there are almost three types, right? The, the shocking um, events that can happen, the vulnerabilities that are known, and then the sort of the man-made institutional governance related ones that may attract less traction um, for sympathy, because these are the ones that people think you can do something about. So when we think about resilience and graduating in a sense from vulnerability to more sustainable areas or more sustainable tracks for growth and development, how can the TVI really assist in determining or helping to determine where certain countries can overcome vulnerability and where it could be a useful tool in trade policy or trade negotiations to move towards a place where they will not need to rely on their vulnerability in order to get a special treatment um, or special carve-outs or special dispensation from the rules? So thinking with our how do we move from here, resilient hat on. Um, I wonder if I could just start a final round of discussion on, on moving from vulnerability to uh, resilience using the TBI. Um, anybody wants to take a stab at it? I don't know if I want to start with Patrick and, and then Jason and then end off with Hannes. Can we go in that order? Um. Just quickly to say, say something about these two questions. I think the question of whether there's going to be acceptance to this, for this index from other interest groups, developing developed countries, it's early days because the, the index hasn't been tested yet. And I think once, once it is, I can see no reason, provided it's not just about trying to get some, some kind of special deal for uh, the countries that are defined by an index, that there's every reason why this can, be, it can balloon out into something much bigger. I really do believe that. And on the S&D related question, I think it depends how you want to define S&D. If you're going to define S&D in this binary way that you either get it or you don't get it, then you're going to have a problem. But if you define it in terms of what your specific needs are, then there's no question that India and China have special needs. And it's just a question of identifying what they are and what they are not. And it's the same for every other country. So I think those two things are really quite straightforward. And, and, and not something that I would uh, exercise my concern over in terms of creating conflicts of interest among countries who have particular concerns and requirements. Um, on the vulnerability is, issue, I think the, you know the, the ones that you that, well that we identified as being more of a self-help nature or domestic policy nature. It's not such a sharp distinction as you might think, because. In, in order to attain this vulnerability, this, uh, in this, uh, this, um, what's the word you were using? This, um, which one? Resilience. Resilience. Yes, resilience, Patrick. This, in order, On in order, high. in order, yes, in order to um, to consolidate this resilience, it doesn't matter if you want. You want to make the distinction between asking for a particular dispensation in terms of something you've already committed to or asking for support from something that you're, that you're embarking upon, it's a slightly uninteresting distinction. All of this is highly trade related. All it, I'm saying is it's a partnership. It requires policies that are formulated at home and it requires support from other sources to make those policies work. So I think that's what the resilience story is. I don't think it's a particularly different story, but I do think it's helpful to have this kind of rather, rather rough taxonomy of different sources of vulnerability, because I think it'll help match them with policy. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for these comments, Jason. And then, Hannes, just bear in mind we have about eight minutes left. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm going to make it quick. But I, I couldn't help but comment on the political support uh, question. I, I think really what is critical there is, is developing consensus. Uh, there needs to be consensus, uh, particularly around the terms um, vulnerability, how it is measured, et cetera. And have we been building consensus? I would argue uh, some consensus is, 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 is probably being built now. I would argue that because uh, there's a, a distinct difference in approach. In the past, uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat did their index, the CDB did their index, and several others did their index almost unilaterally. What we've found is that the COVID-19 pandemic has, has brought such an existential crisis that there's a new movement whereby these organizations are kind of coming together and saying, well, let's see how we can overcome um, some of the criticisms. And I believe in, in this consolidated approach, uh, this new consolidated approach, I believe that in, in that approach, um, the, the political support and the kind of consensus that is needed could emerge in a more in a more forceful way. So I think that this is what is unique about this time. Uh, I think COVID-19 has really provided an environment for us to come together and for us to see how we can move forward um, together, as it were, on a very, very important issue. Now, on the, on, the, on, the, on the other very important matter of moving from vulnerability to resilience, I am hoping that, that as, as this index is, is produced and tracked over time, uh, there, will be more, there will be some incentive, both from the country's perspective, um, as well as from, from its negotiating partner's perspective, to see some progress in terms of, the, in terms of your ranking. No one wants to be uh, at, at the bottom position forever. And I think that, 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 so really, hopefully, the uptake of this approach, it being publicized, it, 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 it gaining some traction, would really help to incentivize the kinds of actions that are needed to move from vulnerability to, to resilience. Excellent. Excellent parting words also from you, Jason. And Hannes, if you can uh, give your comments in the remaining time, which I think, I mean, we may be okay, but feel free to, to speak for the next three, four minutes. Um, you go ahead on this, this resilience end note. Thank you very much, uh, JY. And I think it's, it's really all about resilience, uh, because in the end, we want to move from the problem to the solution. Um, and I would say it's the resilience of the individual player in the system. And, uh, but it's also, and perhaps more broadly, the resilience of the system to actually retain its ability to work efficiently um, uh, with everyone pulling whatever they, the weight they can pull at any given point in time. Um, in an optimal way. I think really this is about optimizing the system, uh, if I can be so detached here. So, um, but perhaps going more specifically to individual and, you know, immediate questions of, of, of resilience. Well, I think the resilience of the system was shown quite clearly in this, in this COVID crisis, as, as, as Travis just mentioned. You know, the attempts to find proper ways of dealing with the, with the efficient and, and best for all distribution of, of medical equipment, these attempts are raw. Um, some of them are better than raw. They are getting somewhere. And I think we've learned something in the process. We need this partnership that Patrick um, mentioned. We need that to be, be, be become the name of the game again. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not overly romantic on this. I'm just saying, um, the, the world was not, the trade world was actually never designed as a, as a, as a highly antagonistic sphere. It is designed as a, as a place where we cooperate and collaborate as much as we can for the benefit of everyone. And the rules are there to help us do that. So if we take that perspective, then it's really about fine tuning the system to increase our resilience. And of course, if I have good supplies, then my trade openness is not a problem. If I, if I, if I have a more secure uh, more reliable access to my uh, to my export markets if I'm highly export concentrated, um, then I have less of a problem. So all of this is building resilience in partnership. So 
I, I think I need to look at my own resilience. Um, that could include things like building the defenses that I need for climate change or other environmental factors, for example, flexibilities in using subsidies. Now, a lot of these flexibilities are in the system. Uh, not least, we have Article 20 of the, of, the, of the GATT. But even there, those of us who know the technicalities know that it's not so easy to differentiate between countries. And there... It, the countries when you take exceptional measures. So it, again, there, and I would have mentioned the need perhaps for a flexibilization when it comes to a rigid MFN principle. We all love MFN. It's the basis of everything, but it's not a panacea. We already know that. So building more flexibility into that to address issues we all agree on increases resilience. Last point, JY, um, the fact this partnership means my tools may also be in authorizing others to do things in certain ways or to, in, to encourage others to do that. And that could go also to things like infrastructure. Now, infrastructure, you know, remoteness needs infrastructure. I need transport links. Transport links are services. Right? If I allow others, for example, in a future subsidies regime for services, if I allow others to subsidize a shipping line to a vulnerable country, but not generally, but only to a vulnerable country, I have I have built infrastructure for that vulnerable country. These are trade-related questions that have not come up yet, perhaps in this or that format, but they will come up. And if you start looking, I'm telling you, from today on, you will see vulnerability and resilience and solutions everywhere you go. And I encourage everyone to do that. Well, thank you so much. I, I think we were worried that we wouldn't have enough to say in an hour and a half, even with Travis gone. but. I just really am excited about this work, excited about having all of you on board and thinking constructively about how to avoid difficult um, or, or take head on some of the difficult conversations we've had around not just SNDT, but targeting the multilateral systems to the needs of a diverse membership. And I think thinking really concretely, concretely from the broad idea of the UMVI, the Universal and Multilateral Vulnerability Index, to the very specific context of the WTO is a move in the right direction. I could not have done it without this August panel, Jason, Patrick, Hannes, and Travis in absentia, to move the paper that we're working on forward and come up with concrete solutions that we can propose to the academic as well as the political community in using a vulnerability index in trade. So thank you to all of you. Keep looking out for that work, and we will be working more closely with you in the future. Thank you all very much, and thank you to the audience for listening in, um, and we look forward to being in touch on this issue in, in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and goodbye.